everybody. I'm so excited to have you here. My name is Tatia Oliveira. I'm the chair of the Education Committee at the International Indian Association. Uh, this is our uh, collective expertise webinar series. It's where members of the INA come in and share their expertise with, with us. So if you do have a, you know, a topic that you're an expert is on, something you're passionate about, I'd love to hear from you and maybe have you presenting uh, in the next coming months. Today, we have Summer Hartman here, and I'm so excited. Thank you so much, Summer. It was a little bit of short notice, you know, just a few weeks, like two weeks or so. I don't know. <laughs> we got you in, um, but I'm very excited. She's going to be talking about sleep. Uh, it's going to be how to learn the new sleep methods to help every family. And here's a little bit about her. Summer Hartman ranked the top 200 best sleep consultants in the United States by Tut.com. She's a rich... Um, Regional Director for the Association of Professional Sleep Consultants, and she's International Certified Newborn Care Specialist. Summer has been working with families since 1996. She's a sleep correspondent for NPR News, Parent.com website, and has been seen on AZ Living. Summer is experienced working with newborn to toddlers and specializing in sleep training singles and multiples, also working with reflux and colic. She has worked with families in many different capacities through in-person, phone, text, and Voxer. Summer lives in Phoenix, Arizona with her husband and two adult children. One thing I need to say is that all opinions and information given during your INA webinar are of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of the INA. Thank you so much guys for joining Summer. You can take over. All right, great. So I wanted to, as I was thinking about today, the program we're going to talk about is just um, teaching sleep with success and how, what does that really mean? Well, for every family, that's totally different. Uh, some families are total cried out form and in other forms they are, um, they're actually uh, no, you know, full gentle approach. So it's really you got to be very adaptive as a sleep consultant and a sleep trainer. You can't just go in with just one single method. You kind of have to do it multiple different ways on each job. So a lot of times um, I was kind of thinking, how am I going to do this? Because you guys are all in different, different age groups with all your children. So I want to open up, I want to kind of know what age group most of you are working with right now so that I can possibly adapt my information to that. So um, who wants to start? I'm not sure how many are here, but go ahead and you can type it in the chat if you can. And let's go ahead and just figure out what age you're at. Right now, I'll continue talking about um, your brain activity when you sleep. So the science behind sleep is so important. Um, why parents, a lot of parents don't understand um, why sleep is so important. They know it, but they don't understand it. So one of the reasons sleep is so important, have any of you had brain fog or pregnant brain or mom brain or nanny brain? Like we're just so exhausted and we can't remember yesterday because we're, we didn't get good sleep, right? So we're so stressed out. So a lot of times um, our brain, if we don't get rest, that seven to nine hours that they recommend, uh, we don't retain short memory. So when, when a mom says to you, oh, I can't remember where I put my keys or I can't remember where I did, it's probably because she has short memory because she's so tired and she's only getting that two or three hours sleep a night. So like I always tell parents, write everything down because I need to see it, you know, because just in case they don't remember. Um, so we definitely, what happens when we sleep is our brain uh, shrinks and fills with uh, liquid. And we have neurons that go off when we're sleeping and it repairs, it's during REM sleep and it repairs it. So if we're not getting that nice stretch of sleep, that deep sleep, it's not repairing. So just a little bit of science behind why sleep is so important. Um, let's see, so we have newborn, zero to 18 months. We have a 13 month old, of course we do. Stacy, we gotta work on that. I'm currently in a classroom teacher, so I'm not working with children at the moment. That's okay. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot. Um, Giselle, nine month old. Okay, so we'll just start where I, <clears throat> we're kind of just gonna start with newborns real quickly. So what is sleep shaping? Um, 
that's a new word that a lot of has come up in the last year and a half. It used to be sleep conditioning. Now we say shaping. It's really just a, it's just a crazy word just to keep things like light because people like fluffy words. So sleep shaping is the same as sleep conditioning where you are going to be gently from the very moment your baby is born or as the parents come home, uh, you'll be guiding that baby on the right feedings. And then you're going to be working on their sleep and you're going to be working on uh, scheduling during the day. And I will hands up all nannies. We have schedules. Like we are top notch when it comes to scheduling. We have to, because that's how our day goes. So it fits right in with um, our teaching, honestly. So when you are having a baby that's a newborn, I'll always work with them starting from day one, working on feeding. Feedings are so important. And actually, this is one thing at the end of this conversation we'll have uh, that is key to sleep is food. If they aren't getting enough food during the day, they will not be able to go through, through the night without, food, without actually having a feeding. So we got to make sure that their weight is up there. They have like seven, eight pounds. If they're seven, eight pounds at birth, um, the first two weeks, we make sure they're growing. And then we can implement uh, a pacifier to hold them off and see if they hold off for a half hour to an hour. And if they do, then we feed then. And that's sleep shaping. You're starting to sleep shape at night. And during the day when parents are asking me like, what schedule should we have? Well, honestly, a newborn schedule for the first four weeks at least is hour up and two hours down. Hour up, two hours down. And when a client tells me that they are, uh, my, baby, my baby doesn't like sleep, that's impossible because they need sleep, but sometimes you have to force the issue and say, you know what, it's time for a nap. And as nannies, we know this. We know, we look at the kid's eyes and they might be like this, and some children don't need as much sleep, but they still need to take a nap. So we just kind of have to work with that. Um, when it comes to sleep shaping a little older, let's say they're now they're five months, they're five weeks old. So five weeks changes. Uh, so five weeks, I would say to eight weeks, we are now on our kind of an hour and 15 minutes up and then they're at an hour and 45 minutes down. And this is based on a three hour feed schedule. I never move to a four hour feed schedule until my kids at night are sleeping 12 hours. Now, other people are totally different. I've, I've actually taught NCSs in my class and they're like, oh, well, we go to a four hour feed schedule during the day at like eight weeks. And that's fine if the baby can take five to six ounces. But see, we're talking a baby that can only take three to four ounces. So you have to base your schedule on what intake they can do. Does that make sense? So everything is on food, basically. So what what that hour and 15 minutes up means is from I don't know exactly what you're asking, but I'll let you not scream. Sorry. <laughs> Esther, can you mute? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so basically, your one hour and 15 minutes is to start from the feed, and then they're going to be up for like 30 minutes of feeding, and then they're going to be up for the next uh, 45 minutes playing. And playing means really putting them on the floor and giving them some floor time. Okay, so this is five weeks old. They need to have that play time started. Um, the other very important thing that parents forget is, and nannies, we know this, I know you guys know this, Playtime is essential to good sleep. If they are held nonstop uh, or walked around, they're not burning energy. They're not exercising, just like we need to exercise. So we want to make sure, can you see me, you guys? Okay. You want to make sure that uh, babies are on the floor or sitting and they're actually having some exercise, like working with their muscles, like work their legs, their arms, you know, do some lifting. All of this pertains to sleep. It's kind of funny. I'm kind of giving you guys schedules, but when sleep is an issue, it's because parents have carried their baby around a lot, or the nannies have carried the baby around, or they, they do a lot of holding, and we're not burning any, really any energy. Can't even say the word, but um, so we want to make sure that's happening. Now, at around six weeks, uh, or actually, let's say nine weeks, um, we're going to be going to, between eight and nine weeks, we're going to go to an hour and a half schedule. And this schedule really stays a part of the routine for like 
four months, like almost to four months old, not four months, but almost four months old. So hour and, actually couldn't even go five months. So hour and a half up, hour and a half down. And that is from the time they wake up. So let's say it's seven, they're going to go down for their nap at 830. And then they're going to be down till 10. So they feed at seven, they go down for a nap at 830, and they're up at 10, and between 945 and 10, and they eat at 10. So this is your whole day, hour and a half up, hour and a half down, hour and a half up, hour and a half down. It's a very smooth and um, good rhythm. Now, some kids are only taking 30 minute naps. We get a lot of these little 30 minute nappers. And a lot of times they just don't have that, that ability to build on the sleep cycle. Um, so it's like one sleep cycle is 20 to 30 minutes. So we have to go and help them. And a lot of times, um, you know, I'll have parents go in and lay your hand on their tummy and shush. Um, one of a really uh, good idea that I got from Mindy Worth, uh, she's a good friend, she's, and I've taught her, she'll go in and she'll rub their forehead and she'll shush and that calms them right down. So anything that you can do to, to like get them back to sleep and break that habit, um, it's a great thing. So yeah, I love Mindy. She's had some great tips. She's very gentle, actually. <laughs> Way more gentle than I am <laughs> when it comes to sleep. Um, so that's kind of the pattern you're going to have for the first four months. And if at night, the pattern you have at night should be the same where every week I have it where I start having the baby um, go from like, they, let's say they go down at seven, at four, four weeks old, I have them on a bedtime routine. They go down at seven and then we, they wake up again at 10. Well, I don't feed them till 11. Okay. So I'm holding them off and I'm not doing it with crying. I'm doing it with a pacifier. I'm rocking them, whatever, to stretch them. But as a newborn care specialist, we're there. So that's what I do. Now, sometimes I'll let them fuss for five minutes or so um, because they don't really cry. They're just, you know, giving an eh, eh, eh. So that tells me they're, they're fine. So I'll let them be. But if they start really crying, I'll pick them up or I'll offer a passy and just try to get them go longer. And a lot of times they wake up too, that we forget is they break out of the swaddles. So I, I swaddle is key to sleep. And if they're, they're uncomfortable in the swaddle, um, I personally hate the dream swaddle. I know a lot of you love it, but I don't like their arms bent um, because here they can't stretch them out. And what if they get like a Charlie horse in their arm. So to me, I like their arms either straight down or we're not swaddling and it's going to be up. I want, I want them to be able to straighten their arms out. So I'll use the halo uh, with the arms inside the sack and swaddle over. And then I'll use the miracle blanket too. Um, when they're really little, I'll use the swaddle knee, but that's a really loud Velcro. And there is a new swaddle that's out there. I'm not sure if Amazon's shipping now. Um, but it's got a very, it's a silent Velcro. So just look up silent Velcro and you guys will find the new swaddles. So basically that's how the whole three months goes is that you're every week I'm getting that baby down through the night um, by one hour. So then the next week it's 12 o'clock and the next week it's one o'clock. And sometimes I'm doing it every three days where I'm pushing them to go a little bit longer. And so it's math in your head. Uh, where you're like, okay, it's one o'clock. Okay, they've reached 12 o'clock. I'm going to push them a little bit more and see if they can do it. So it's just thinking ahead um, while you're on the job, trying to get those babies to go longer and longer and longer. And by between six to 12 weeks, usually six weeks, I have one feed. And by 12 weeks, zero. And it's a very gentle approach. This isn't done with very little crying, if at all. Um, so when, you, when it comes to teaching sleep successfully, you have to coach the parents or you have to be really good with that daytime schedule. So the days make the nights is what I tell people. If they are not, um, if they are not following through with ounces during the day or nursing sessions, long enough nursing sessions, we're not gonna have enough to you know, basically let them sleep longer they're gonna to need to eat. So I'm not gonna take any food away from a child that I feel is actually not gaining well and is not eating well. Um, I just actually, my last job was in December and they were twins and they were just like really tough that first 
six weeks, mom and dad were so frustrated. And I mean, they were fussy for me at night, but they had company every week. So the bedrooms were all really close together. So a lot of times when we're working nights, we're all self-conscious of letting a baby cry because grandma's across the hallway. So when I came to work one night, it was like six weeks old now, the twins, and the mom looked at me and she goes, I'm paying you, she's not. I don't care if you have to let them cry. It was like, okay, <laughs> if that's how you feel, but grandma has panic attacks. And I know that because I'd hear her get up and pound around into the bathroom. Like it would really make her mad. So we have to like weigh what is, you know, what is going to work and what's not. And this is where different methods really come in handy because not necessarily am I going to let them cry if I have a frustrated grandma in the house or whatever. So overall, we got through that six week period of fussiness and I got to soothe them. And then by the time that I was hurt, I had an accident, uh, my last week of the job, they slept 12 hours. So I had done my job. So even though I didn't get to finish it out that last week, they were sleeping 12 hours. So it really is about uh, getting your patterns started. And then you'll see a turning point around the eight to 12 week mark. You're gonna see a nice turning point in the sleep at night. But again, parents have to be on board. We can't just assume that we're allowed to do something. So make sure you have open communication and how the process is gonna be working. Um, I'm all about every night we go through what I'm gonna do um, if the parents are up. If not, then I'll leave notes and say this is what I did. So we wanna make sure uh, that everything is on board so we don't worry. So let's go into, um, uh, basically I have a story of an 11 week old. A lot of people say, you can't sleep train babies to sleep 12 hours and it's just, or eight hours even. And technically by AAP guidelines, eight, five to eight hours of stretch of sleep is technically sleeping through the night. So whenever I have a client that I always guarantee eight hours for sure, because I never want to overestimate. What if you go into a job and you say, oh, I can get that baby sleeping 12 hours, hands down. And then that baby has issues or you see that the parents aren't following through. Well, then your job is going to look bad because you guaranteed 12 hours and that baby's only making it eight. So you wanna make sure you don't ever overestimate anything. You wanna make sure you underestimate it and just say, well, I can get them to eight to 10 hours. We'll be, you know, we'll hopefully get to 12, but we don't know. And again, remember to tell them they're not robots, they're human. So as humans, we have different things that can happen. So we wanna make sure you set yourself up for success as a, as a newborn care specialist and a trainer. Um, this 11 week old, I flew out on this job to Washington DC. Um, I was gifted by a past client seven years ago and they recently gifted me last February to this family. And they didn't even know what to expect. I showed up on their doorstep and it was like Mary Poppins moment with my carpet bag. And they had no clue who I was, what I do. Like they were just young kids in their like twenties and had this 11 week old baby. And they're like, oh, so what do you do? Like, here's a room for you to stay in. and but they were so in love with their child, they didn't really want me with her during the day, which this is a 24 hour job. So I basically just let them um, take care of her and I observed. And so I just edited like certain things. Ethan took the card. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, so what I did is I just observed them and then I had them critique. Um, I had them critique like her napping, like how she napped, but I also just let them do their own thing for a couple of days because I wanted to observe. It's kind of like watching, um, you know, Super Nanny, how she observes. And I think that is so key to any training, just to let parents know you're observing because you need to see what you need to tweak. Because a lot of times it may be perfect and they just need to tweak a couple of things and that's it. So that's pretty much what I did on that, that those two days I watched and observed and I did not adjust anything during the day. They did very well. She napped wonderful. I adjusted the crib. I darkened the bedroom um, and her swaddle. I made sure they swaddled her right. And uh, in the seven days that I, or six days that I was there, <coughs> sorry, I had to get the flu shot a couple days ago. Um, the couple days before, 
uh, she was starting to break out of the swaddle. So over those two days I observed her, I decided to put her in just a regular sleep sack with arms out. She was 11 weeks old and she slept much better. So making sure that you observe the situation, make sure that you realize that she may not need to be swaddled. You know, 11 week old may have more control of her arms at this point. So she went from waking up at 11. So she went down at seven. She'd wake up at 11. I let her fuss for 20 minutes. And I mean fuss, like it wasn't screaming cry. It was a cry that was like not a screaming cry. And then at 20 minutes, she went back to sleep and slept till three. I didn't do anything. And that's half the battle. Sometimes it's just parents run in. The minute they hear them, they run in. So giving them some time to like settle in, give a little bit of cry is better than just rushing straight in. So in over that five days, I think I was there actually six days, now I'm thinking Saturday, um, she slept uh, a total of 10 hours from the time that I started on Monday and I left on Saturday. So you can train babies and it's just simple adjustments that you have to look for and uh, teach parents. All right, so moving on to four to nine months old. Uh, sleep training for one uh, between four months is the sleep transition. I call it transition. You guys call it regression. A lot of people call it sleep regression, and it's not. It's a complete transition. Um, so transitions, what does that mean? Transitions are when baby is growing up and is changing and getting more aware. So what happens is now they're four months. They definitely need to be unswaddled. Parents definitely go way too long swaddling. Baby's fighting that. They should be starting to roll. And if they're not, then we need to work on that because rolling is going to help them develop. Uh, they should be pushing up, looking side to side. They should be grabbing toys. Uh, there's a lot of developmental things that are happening and they're just way more aware. They are going to watch you a little bit longer. And parents think at this time um, that baby is you know, oh, the dreaded, the dreaded uh, regression. Oh, they're waking up multiple times. And a lot of times it's because of lack of food. So during this four month regression, they call it, um, they really need to eat. And as soon as you level out the amount during the day, increase it or even give them like an extra feed, um, they will start sleeping longer and longer and longer. And during this time, we may need to add in a night feed even if they were sleeping 12 hours before, we may need to eat, add in like a 3 a.m. feed because we need to add those ounces in somewhere and then we start moving those extra ounces in during the day. Does that make sense? So everything that we do is based on food. Right, guilty regression, it's crazy. So people feel like guilt, highly guilty about, about that. All right, well, it was nice meeting you. Um, so basically what we want to do now is we want to just adjust that feeding during the day and then have parents do a little bit more, allowing a little more fussing time uh, when they wake up at night, give them that 10 to 20 minutes, and then they usually adjust pretty quickly and we'll go back to sleeping through the night. Um, it's really not that hard, but a lot of things get really messed up during that, re that regression. Um, years ago, um, we used to have this thing where um, parents would feed their babies, right? We feed them at four months. So they started getting solids at four months. And so we didn't have these regressions because they were getting those extra food. And so when we have that, now we don't feed them till six months. So there's this delay, even though we're not supposed to. So just increase the ounces. That's the point. Just increase food and then giving them a few minutes to fuss and you should be good. Um, so when it comes to older babies, uh, what is the biggest thing with a nine month old that you're gonna have is standing. When they stand up in the crib, that is the hardest thing that you're gonna have because now they don't know how to sit. And as a nanny, I would always instruct the nannies when I'm on these jobs to train them or the parent to train them, sit down, you need to sit down. So you train them and you take your hands and you sit them down. So tummy time, yep, tummy time's good. Um, refusing to crawl is not, a, it's not too big a deal. Um, every baby's different, so just keep putting toys in front of him um, and also pushing his feet against your palms to kind of make him like sit on his knees helps. Um, but every baby can develop a little bit differently. 
Um, nine months isn't too bad for not crawling. Give it like another, t another month. Uh, but definitely you have to work with them like crazy. Yeah, so does mom hold the baby a lot? So Jan uh, Jancel, she's saying he screams a lot, requesting to be held. So if mom's holding him a lot, that's gonna be an issue uh, because that's what he's used to, right? He's now nine months and that's what he wants and he's gonna demand it. So if mom is used to doing that, she has to work with you in order to get him on the floor. So I would have a discussion with her and just say, we need to work on putting him down more, even if he sat in his high chair. Um, if they have a high chair, put him down in the high chair in the kitchen so that they can see mom or wherever they're at. We work for a high profile family, so they may never be in the kitchen. I don't know. <laughs> um, she talks back every time he screams. Does she, does she talk back to him or, or she picks him back up? Okay, so basically when during this time, it's really hard as a nanny to have any control because the mom is the lead. So he's basically, um, I would ignore the crying a little bit while he's doing it because then it would be less of like, we're not feeding into his screaming. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to encourage the mom to like, give it, give it like two minutes. Like, okay, let's just let him be for two minutes. And then, yeah, see, this is all mom thing. It's, it's really hard. You're going to have to teach her. And if she's not really listening, a lot of parents don't want anything to do with the nannies in that they don't want to listen to the, to, to us. Um, I have a client like that myself who was very adamant. Like he, he just, she baby talked a lot to her child at nine months. And that was the first thing I observed when I sat there. She was just like, you're okay. You can do it. And uh, I always tell people, don't baby talk, like actually treat them like they're adults, like talk to them um, like they know what, you, what you're talking about. That is like the most important thing. So that's what I, I teach parents is that. So nine months transition, um, you have to teach them how to sit from a standing position when they start to stand in the crib. It is like super important now it can it only takes like three days to train them but you do have to attend them at night uh quite a bit you have to go in over and over and over again this isn't something simply like leaving them so sometimes what i'll do is i'll give uh, a minute or two while they're standing and walking around the crib and then i'll go in in the dark and um put them back down and then i will bring them back up or I will leave them and go back out and they come back up and then I'll go back in another minute later. So this can happen over and over and over again. And like one job I had a nine month old and she was so stubborn. And I just was like, I was like done. I'm like, I'm not going in for 20 minutes. Like I had gone in for two days straight. And on that last decision making day, it was the third night. Um, I said, I'm not going in for 20 minutes. And she sat down after one minute and I was just like, Oh, thank God. So um, it worked and she sat down and she went to sleep. No problem at all. Grabbed her pacifier that was in the crib and uh, we had no problems ever since. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work at nine months, but it can be done and parents just have to dedicate themselves to it if you're coaching them. Uh, if you're the trainer, you just realize you're going to be in there. Um, and I'm sure other people have many different tricks uh, and how to train older babies. Um, but this is just one of those things you, you kind of have to teach them. And then, of course, um, I give parents a booklet that teaches them how to, to teach their baby during the day how to sit and stand, sit and stand. It's like an instructional thing. So naps, um, you got to make sure that they're, they're actually tired. So it depends on the schedule. So for a nine-month-old, they can be up to two and a half hours before their nap. So this is where they're like, their bottles are more four hours. So if they were waking up at seven uh, for the day, they wouldn't go down until nine, nine thirty, and then they could be down till uh, 10 30 at 11. So you want to make sure that they have plenty of floor time, play time before bed. And <coughs> sorry, you want to make sure that they have that 
um, before their naps. So what is the issue uh, with this baby's naps? Is parents probably cater to him, I imagine? Like, do they allow any crying? Genzel? He cries a lot for naps. So what time is he going down for his nap? <coughs> Sorry. Stupid cold. So what's the stretch between when he time, what time is his naps like schedule? Is it like two hours up or is he 2.5? So you wanna make sure that you're not missing his uh, sleep cues. Like if he's overtired by two and a half hours, then it could be he's not gonna go to sleep. Is he tired enough by two and a half hours? We definitely still wanna have two naps a day at nine months. You don't wanna get rid of that. Um, but you may have to like figure out what is his tired signs and get him outside in the backyard if you can or take him for a stroll before nap to try to like get some fresh air. Fresh air does a body good. So if we're not quarantined in the house forever. Well, I mean, a nine month old can cry a long time. So for naps, I usually, I actually um, don't go in for like 30 minutes for naps. Like it's, it's full on. They need to go to sleep on their own without any help. Um, so I typically leave them for 30 minutes, go in, put them back down, give them a passy if they take it, pat their bottom, and then um, leave the room again. So it's a little bit more um, aggressive at this age because they are way more aware. And it can also take them the whole nap before they take a nap. So a lot of times parents are like, he just went to sleep and it's been an hour and a half of crying. I let them um, nap for 30 minutes longer and then we get them back up to keep them on schedule. So it's interesting for sure. You have to just kind of really be strict. I'm pretty strict with the schedules during the day when they go down, uh, once you figure out that pattern. Um, so you're asking how long is a good nap for you in this case. Um, so naps uh, in the morning, no more than an hour and a half. And in the afternoon, two to three hours if possible. Because what happens is around the 15 month mark, the child is gonna take it down, or even between 13 and 15 months, they take it down to one nap. And the one nap is gonna be your afternoon nap, is gonna be your long nap. So I always like to have a shorter morning nap yeah, if you can only 30 minute nap if lucky. Yeah, I mean, this, he's obviously fighting his sleep. So there's something off. You can contact me after um, so we can run through the schedule if you want. I feel like uh, there's, some, there's, there's variables to every situation. Um, you can't just say, uh, my child hates sleep. I get that a lot. My child hates sleep and, and not necessarily. <laughs> it does sound like your kid, Stacy. <laughs> A little bit, wee bit. <laughs> um, so the 30 minute naps, they're, they're, they're very convenient, but we have to like let leave them in their crib. Stacy, leave him in his crib and work. Just, <laughs> he'll be fine. <laughs> they're in a safe space. Um, yeah, 30 minute naps are hard. I mean, and they're not really, they're just getting like a cat nap. They're not getting that full deep sleep. They're only getting that, that very light sleep. So they feel it almost wires them up. So we wanna make sure that we kind of uh, give him a little bit longer. So I would say he has to, Stacy, he has to stay in that bed for an hour. <laughs> Don't go in. Um, so when it comes to like older children, like your um, two-year-olds, let's say 15 months of two-year-olds, you're gonna be on a one nap schedule. They have a lot of energy. So you wanna make sure that you get a lot of that playtime out during the day. They also have lunch before they go down. And then they, after lunch, they still have playtime. Don't just go straight from food to bed. Um, I like to keep it where they have a little more, they can go to the bathroom or whatever. You kind of work out that little loss of energy. And then they start to like, you can, I've had some kids like my own fall asleep in the, um, they'll fall asleep in their high chair. Like I have pictures of spaghetti everywhere and they're like sound asleep. And you know, it's like you've reached their, their exhaustion moment right there. So you just wanna make sure you're watching those cues. Make sure lunch is about 35 minutes before nap um, or 45 minutes before nap. 
if possible, so that they can have a little bit of playtime. Um, but when it comes to sleep methods, I want to talk a little bit about that because you have like really four main sleep methods. You have the full on extinction method, which is like, don't go in at all, um, let them cry. And then you have your Ferber method, which is timed. Um, and then you have your parental method where it's like you have like a certain amount of like, I think this is the best one actually where it's gut feeling. Um, you kind of just, you don't time it. You just follow your child's cries and you, kind of give um, a gut feeling like, okay, they've reached their limit, so I'm gonna go in. It doesn't have to be consistent. You know, okay, we're gonna do five minutes, we're gonna do 15 minutes. Um, because um, I think that parents have lost their feeling of following their gut. I mean, as nannies, I don't know about you guys, but I always followed my gut when it came to training my kids, um, all my nanny jobs. And even when it comes to this career, um, I don't do times with parents. I just kind of say, oh, I think you need to go in and check on him. Um, and that could be like it was only two minutes or it was actually 40 minutes. So we just don't really, that's the best, best method to teach is actually just listening to their cries and learning what each of those are. Um, but there are several different ways that you can call it when you're training people. Uh, what other questions do you guys have? We're about we have about 18 minutes. I think I covered a lot, but you guys can open it up if you want and ask questions. Anybody? Y'all busy? <laughs> All right. So one of the main things um, you want to do is make sure they have blackout curtains. Um, make sure that the babies are fed properly and also be consistent with um, the feedings as much as possible. Be on like a three hour feed schedule when they're little. Um, you wonder a bit about the transition into two naps. So the two naps start to develop uh, at between six and seven months old. So we are gonna get rid of that cat nap at six months old. Um, typically they just start not taking it. They just don't wanna go down. So. I would say that you, you start going from a morning nap to and an afternoon nap at around between six and seven months. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're talking two naps to one nap. All right. So it really depends on if they're, okay, so this is the transition. When they are going from two naps to one nap, it's they stop taking that morning nap. Like it starts getting shorter, shorter, and shorter. So it goes from um, an hour, it goes from like a, you know, an hour and a half long to an hour long to 30 minutes. And, it, and they're, when they wake up, they're totally happy. And when that happens, you know that they're ready to transition to just one nap a day. Like it's not worth forcing your child to go down or your nanny child to go down at that time. Um, so you're saying the kids still do well with the two hour in the morning and I have to wake them up, but then the afternoon isn't. So definitely shorten that morning nap um, to hour and a half max. And you have to wake a baby during the day. Like, okay, so the philosophy is wake them up during the day and at night we let them sleep. Because if they sleep too long in the morning, they're, they're not gonna have a long nap in the afternoon. And it is really hard to transition a two to three hour nap, morning nap to the afternoon. So start shortening that morning nap so that you can get a longer nap in the afternoon and then that transition to one nap a day is much easier. How do you help parents who want us to use a no cry approach? You, uh, that's just hands on. I mean, honestly, a no cry approach is, uh, it's a way more uh, in depth package that you're gonna offer. Um, you're gonna respond and it's longer. So I always tell people the no cry approach is about $10,000 and my, um, some fussing approach and having a little bit of tears is about four thousand dollars. So, you're you're gonna have the money symbols are a little bit more, <laughs> because when it comes to no crying approach, you have to spend a lot more time attending them. Um, you can do it where there's not really a true no cry approach because babies are always gonna fuss. Um, but you you can sit in the room next to the crib with them you can sit there and pat them over i mean i've done it where i had a client have a miscarriage when i arrived it was horrible 
and I was going out there to sleep train her 12 month old. And as you know, 12 month old is who's nursed all night long since for 12 months and slept with mom and then taking her and putting her in her crib was really difficult. And mom then miscarries while I'm there and they, she couldn't handle, like, she felt like the baby's tears were tearing her from the inside out. And so I had to be on my foot, like on my feet with this job, like, okay, I'm going to give her two minutes. And I got to like, at the fourth day, I got to like 20 minutes of letting her fuss. But in the beginning, that first night, I was going in every two minutes and laying her down every two minutes, every two minutes. And I didn't mean no crying because she cried the entire time, but I was right there in the room with her and I kept laying her down all night long. And um, in the morning, I just teach the parents to like hug and kiss them and just tell them, oh, there's Mason, uh, hug and kiss them and treat it like they had a great night because they did. They stayed in their crib all night. And on that fourth night when I got to 20 minutes, uh, she slept 11 hours. So it does work, um, but no cry approach is really kind of tricky. You have to word it differently as in that there is no never, no tears. It's just that you're not letting them uh, alone. You're not leaving them alone. You're going to attend them every, every time they cry. Um, there is an NCS in LA. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's getting dry. That attended every whimper that this baby had and he was like six months old and she went in and she rubbed him his back and she patted his bottom and every time he whimpered and it took four weeks but he slept solid through the night and I was just like I can't do it I will never do that kind of approach it just is not in my body to do it but it can be done um, you guys just have to figure out what works best for you and how to explain it to the client is so important. This is what I teach in my classes. Um, you know, I, you, you have to, how you word things is key to how you're going to train. So you got to think of that. Um, let's see. I have a hesitation to push the morning nap to later because they're definitely tired by 10. So, well, put them down, just shorten their nap. So put them down like normal and just wake them up at the hour and a half and just adjust it is what I would do. That's pretty much it. Um, that's my 17 year experience has been these munchkins are challenging me. You know, I think that we have a challenging client once a year. I don't think it's like easy anymore. <laughs> I have clients where I actually, as a sleep consultant, uh, one year I gave back like $4,000 over a period of the whole year to clients because I was like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, I'm too, you're not listening to anything I'm teaching. I've given you all the materials and you're not, you're not listening. So I've actually given money back um, because I don't want to hurt my reputation. And if I can't fix it, I'm not going to keep your money. So, um, but that was like three years ago. Ever, I haven't done any of that since so three years ago. And actually one of those moms just had a baby and actually wanted me to come work for her. And I did tell her I was not giving her money back this time. <laughs> um, so, you know, every situation is different. I think you got to look at the kids and the situation they're in. I think right now we need to all consider uh, the stress that we're all under with this virus and how scary it is. So our approach to how we teach sleep is going to be a lot more hands-on. I think we're going to do a lot more gentle approach because parents are scared. And honestly, I'm scared too. Like this isn't easy. And to put stress on your baby, uh, we don't want babies to get sick because then we're gonna worry if do they have the coronavirus. So I think we're all gonna have to really rethink how we sleep and condition babies and really be more gentle so they don't get ill. Um, a lot of times when we sleep train at any age and they do a lot of crying, the next week they'll get like a cold. And it's just because their, their system is kind of overloaded when we're training. And that can be really hard on us now because we don't know if it's like the flu or if it's a cold or if it's this illness. So I think the approach we have to take is a more uh, gentle approach from here on out um, until we figure this out. But everybody can train, every baby can train. And to tell you the truth, we don't train babies. 
uh, we're actually training parents. So when a parent hires me, I let them know that I'm the one training you. Um, and, and that's how this works. <laughs> and the baby will do what I tell it to do because that's just what he was going to do. Uh, but really, it's follow through from the parent's side of things. So, uh, and that applies to nannying too. And right now, you guys have an ability to create a nanny package of trainings. If you feel like you're an expert in this, then create a package that you can teach parents how to have a day schedule with their kids, how to do disciplinary um, with the children without getting overheated. Because a lot of parents are gonna start getting upset with their kids and start yelling. And believe me, I've been there. I've got two teenagers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can start thinking of ways to make an income outside of working in these homes and actually supporting these families because we, are in a, we were in a me, me, me uh, for long years and now parents have to take care of their kids. So, um, there's just, a, there's an opportunity to grow here for you guys. Uh, I hope this helped you. Uh, do you teach how to create? Yeah, I do. I, it's a part of my training. Um, and I individualize create packages based on how you guys teach each and every one of the women who've taken my training. Uh, I base everything on specifics of their website, their town, um, how they teach. So, I mean, you have to, because you can't just have a generalized package for everybody. Um, I don't believe in that. I think you guys all are different. So that's, that's what we have to create. So, um, anything else? I think I covered quite a bit. <laughs> um, let me see, be consistent. Uh, firm with the day schedule when you're training. Um, yep, I think that's it. I covered it all pretty much. Uh, so you guys can reach out to me at Summer Sleep Secrets if you have questions. Um, there's a questionnaire on my website you can always fill out and I'll give you a call back. Or you can call my 800 number, 866. Um, it's 866-976-4944. So... Awesome. Thank you so much, Summer. That was very informative. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. Yes, thank you so much. All right, guys. So if you don't have any questions, um, we are going to end here. And again, this is going to be available for replay uh, on your member portal or the INA YouTube channel. So thank you again. Stay safe. Keep washing those hands. And I'll see you next month. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye.